I'm extremely pleased today to be able to carry on a conversation with Professor G. V. Dasani. Professor Dasani is Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas in Austin, and is, he's the author of many famous novels, short stories, and other literary texts, philosophical writings, writings on literature, religion, and many other topics. Professor Dasani, let's have a talk about your entire literary and philosophical career Beginning with your move to, journal, to England as a young man, what brought you to England? I ran away from home uh, three times. And uh, I happened to have, with a good deal of cunning, a minor's passport. You cannot travel if you're a minor. I was a minor in Indian law, 18. And uh, I stayed in England for a number of years, hiding from my people, because I had an uncle, a lawyer, very disagreeable man. I like to speak kindly of him. And uh, from fear, so that was the beginning of my landing in England. And what was your first activity in England? Did you start off doing journalistic work? No, I'm afraid that it wasn't. I didn't have enough English. That was my problem. Uh, I was not prepared for it. I tried to run away from home twice, and uh, I was duly brought back home with the assistance of police, and that's why I couldn't live a normal life in England. For two years I stayed in England. But you eventually became a journalist. How did that uh, career begin? I, it is uh, difficult to explain, but the fact is that I met Horace Ship, who was a famous person. He used to write for John London's Weekly. Uh, they still remember him. And uh, Ship had friends, and he told me that if I could give him some material on uh, on Indian films, I had seen some. Then we wrote a weekly letter for the Statesman, Calcutta, which was a very famous newspaper owned by the British company. And that was the beginning. And he was very kind towards me and kept in touch with me 40 years afterwards. So. And he became a very prolific journalist, both in uh, Europe and England and then later in India. Well, some people, uh, Professor Kellner, have peculiar things happen to them, and my arrival in Texas will be one of those. I was in Yarkord, it's a place away from everywhere, 5,000 feet above sea level, nobody goes there. Now Government of India, because I wrote so much about it, I now want to make a resort of it and ruin it all. Mm -hmm. Now, I stayed there and locked my door with a padlock outside, don't want to see anyone. I wasn't seeing anyone for about six months, and a famous journalist, editor of Illustrated Weekly, he happened to have traveled from Bombay without any warning. Uh, the Indian folk think this is very friendly. I'm grateful to you for giving me notice to come and talk to you. But they just call, and then he found the padlock and he inquired from the. He has written about this, by the way. Inquired from the neighbors. He said he's inside. If you stand outside the door, and simply shout your name, and he might open it. Well, I had to go and open the door, and then he was entertained at White House and so on as a famous journalist. So he told me to give him the key to open the padlock. I had lost the key. So he said, my wife is with me now. That is terrible in India if you bring your wife. She'll have many problems. So anyway, we got her through a window. Her face was quite red. I said, you boost her up and I'll help her from inside. And he told me to write a column for him. I told, what are you doing here? I told him, I just want to think. That's why I'm here. Anyway, he persuaded me to do so. And afterwards, a series of actions, I got a uh, good many readers. I mean, an invitation from Chicago to come and address a seminar, Cable, also takes us here. Also, an important thing, uh, invitation from Burmese government to stay in a monastery, which I did for five months. Mm -hmm. uh, these things happen, and that tells you, you know, my very close contact with Theravada Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Silver, when he was dean here, he wrote to me that he wanted me to talk about Buddhism somehow, or that it has been known that I was involved in Buddhism. So that's how it happened, series of actions, and later on I have a very large reading ship in India and abroad. And well, let's go back to your experiences in England as a young man and go through your wartime activity with the BBC. That happens. It, I was back in England 15 days before the war started. 
it is then I have been active in England, extremely active. As a matter of fact, I was the spokesman for the British Ministry of Information on the uh, entire background uh, of the war zone. And I had to go to Oxford colleges, to Army, Navy. I was enrolled as an adult education tutor in the war office. The Americans had me. There are many Americans, hospitals, others. So I think uh, I haven't got a list. I mean, one day we'd be going with the RAF, uh, you know, they had invited the next day others. And that was my job, and that made me extremely active in it during those days, talking all the time. So you were lecturing constantly during World War oh, yes. II to different well, audiences? Different audiences. That is exceedingly difficult to get audience on a Sunday in Scotland, but uh, New Picture House, Edinburgh, the ministry got it for me to house the people. The other people were a war hero, uh, I forget his name, uh, Jew Bear his name was, and Winston Churchill and Archbishop of Canterbury. These are the four people who could fill up our son in the uh -huh. So I must have been well known. I <laughs> would imagine so. Yeah. You also were doing radio broadcasting for the BBC. Yes, they World sent World for World. me as advisors on BBC plays. I wrote the scripts for them. I spoke for them. It wasn't the propaganda. We used to have series like George Orwell started one, and uh, that series had uh, uh, books that changed the world. And uh, Orwell asked me to speak on Bhagavad Gita. Now, the Indian studies were extremely good in England because they had stayed in India, conquered the country, mm -hmm. and ruled it. And the British Museum, I mean, you get books which you do not get in India. Now, I brought Meanwhile, during my 10 years absence from England of 15, I had looked into the Indian sources of knowledge. And one of the statements I made in this talk on Bhagavad Gita, which was that this book, which is a religious classic, and there are excellent American translators of it, beautiful, and also Englishmen, this book has a practical instruction for people who will follow the sage who compiled the book out of the epic Mahabharata. This is a chapter. In it it says that you should, Krishna, the incarnated God says, do home, this word. It means a fire sacrifice. You, you take a, some grain flowers and you offer it in a flower, treating the fire offer it to the fire, treating the fire as a deity of representative deities. It says that you should do home, the reader of this particular book, of prana, that is the vitalities in us which make us function the way we do, into lower prana, below the navel. Make the fire and make this sacrifice, fiery sacrifice. I had inquired from everybody I know, including Professor Radhakrishna, who was the president of India and Oxford professor. Up to date, 50 years it was, nearly 40 years, nobody tells me what it means. Mm. This was the situation at that time in England. And of course, when I raised these questions, I had a lot of calls now and then to say, come and explain it, the difference between Christianity and Hinduism, including uh, the first Englishman uh, who went to Lhasa, alas, I forget his name, at friend's house, a very big meeting, and churches, indeed, they were asking questions, the influence of the West on the East, issues like this. In what did I have any criticism? I don't have any nationalism, I don't believe in groupism. Therefore, I was able to truthfully say, this is the state of our education and occasionally some enlightenment. Now, this particular lecture, I recall you were asking me to tell you about my experiences. It was in Harrow, an uh, important church in Harrow. And I was compelled to tell them that we were frightfully backward on moral issues as Hindus, as Indians. And uh, I was answering the propaganda from Germany all the time, obliquely. That was not my job. But you had some fools there who were talking about Arianism and so on. And I was very, rather well informed on it, and so we have faults which were never mentioned uh, by the Indians or by the Germans. A spokesman, they were professors and tutors. So this was the issue I raised, that in India we have 
treated certain individuals, Brahmins for instance, or Kshatris, the warrior caste. I am uh, from a warrior caste. Gautama Buddha was from a warrior caste. That, uh, that these people are absolutely excellent. They are not only chosen people, as in Jewish tradition, they were twice born. Every other person on earth was born once. We are a very superior people. I gave the quotations about it and naturally the British people were very fair people at that time and it was a good time in, in that that people were rather keen on ideas. There was danger the country might be conquered etc. And I think I saw the expression from the faces of the people, now this got to be stopped you see. But the enlightenment part the, which made me be in demand was that when I told them that that was uh, the institution of kingship, you consider kings, queens as excellent by birth without any reference to any achievements they might have had to their career. And this is what the Indians were doing too. Hmm. As they were in an advantageous position, we are Brahmins by birth, we are a superior people, although it is offensive to any person otherwise. So it is Things like these that I b had to go to Rhodes Trust invited me, Oxford University Colleges invited me, and at that time to deliver a lecture entitled India Invites it was rather a courageous thing to do because the Indians hated the British for a very good reason. They wanted them out mm -hmm. and Gandhi was threatening to launch a, you know, a, a campaign, quit India in spite of the fact that the Indian contribution to the war, when it all ended, was more than all the British colonies and the dominions combined. But they were giving parties, some Indian friends, businessmen, if a British ship sank, and the British hated the Indians, I mean, uh, to start this kind of a brawl at this moment, they have sort, sort of love and hate relationship with them. Mm -hmm. But uh, these conflict of ideas were there all the time, don't you see? Mm -hmm. And uh, so sorry, I lost the well, track. Well, uh, you help me. Yes, this is very interesting to hear about your philosophical and political activity during uh, World War II, where you were explaining more or less India to the British, and you were giving some of the philosophical yeah, perspectives. Yeah. Yes. So my lecture was dedicated to the fact mm -hmm. that India invites you to come mm -hmm. back. This title was a new college, Oxford. Mm -hmm. This was a thing in which my particular attitude show up because I didn't, wasn't carried away by the British hatred, nor was I carried away by the Indian hatred for the mm -hmm. British. I simply don't have it. I don't mm -hmm. have to have a theory about it. Right. I think it's bloody awful, that's all there is. Right. But nationalism and hatred is a source of much evil quite right. in the world. And uh, these things came up and therefore I was in demand and uh, mm -hmm. by both sides. And then they, uh, I had people interviewing me, etc. I have a photograph of a BBC interviewing me. And they had the World Service. That brings in everybody. Right. You, see. you also became involved in literary circles in England oh, at that yes. time and published a very popular first novel all about H. Hatter, which well, was quite a literary sensation that all of the top literary critics and writers uh, very enthusiastically received. Well, according, you see, uh, I had carried manuscripts of six books with me uh, in England at that time. I used to sit up at night, I never sleep during the day. Besides, I had an infirmity, uh, I mean, insomnia, I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep. Therefore, I couldn't adjust myself to any situation as a normal person. So I sit up the whole night and I had written six books, among them a children's book, etc. And I thought, uh, we will uh, launch these books. Since I was meeting all kinds of people, mm -hmm. readers for publishers and so forth, the paper shortage in the war time, you couldn't get any book published. Nonetheless, I had these books and then it might interest you part of my biography that mm -hmm. under 18 I am about the only person who have been uh, allowed to use the reading room of the British Museum. It's against the law. You have to be 21. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to be accredited scholar. Mm -hmm. This was done because uh, George Lansbury at that time was almost a deputy prime minister next to McDonald. He telephoned and insisted, somebody took me to him, mm -hmm. talked to me for half an hour, and he said, uh, uh, 
the boy has genius. He yelled at him. And afterwards, they gave me this ticket, a reader's ticket, as an independent private scholar. Mm -hmm. So I was reading these things, and I saw the names around from Shakespeare to Gibbon, and I came to a conclusion. Uh, uh, these books are not worth publishing. Mm. So, I mean, everything had been said. So I thought, I will invent a style of my own and confide it in people. They ridiculed me. It was very difficult. Indeed, they advised me, good friends, that you should leave the country, come back after 10 years. Mm. Uh, and then uh, it might, there weren't anybody doing anything like that. In any case, this book grew during the war. I kept on changing it, I kept on changing it. George Orwell got irritated with me, told me, you are playing the fool, single-minded me. He wrote me a letter to that effect. I've saved it, and mm. I read it the other day in Delhi. And uh, this should not be done, and it's uh, just uh, silly. Anyway, somebody suggested show it to T.S. Eliot, and I sent it to T.S. Eliot. This is the, the manuscript of your novel uh, uh, all about H. Uh, indeed, I did. Okay. And uh, Mr. Elliot uh, said that this was a, an astonishing thing. He, he didn't think anybody could sustain a, a book in this style and tempo. At that time, people didn't know the meaning of the word tempo in Shakespeare's plays, to best of my knowledge, is the only book written by an Indian professor, Banaras University, who is blind. His wife reads things to him. Uh -huh. That this was an issue in writing. There were several things that I did. The most important thing to my uh, consideration was to use the language as characterization, mm. the selection of the language. Therefore, if I had an illiterate or semi-illiterate character, he must speak illiterate or semi-illiterate language. Now, you could carry this excessively, and you can produce a bore on the stage, who is a bore, but he must not bore the audience. That defeats its own purpose. Now, if you get an illiterate speaking as an illiterate, uh, he will wear you out. I mean, after 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, meet too many fools. So I did this book, and Mr. Elliot wrote this letter, and what is more, that he allowed us, risked his reputation. It was, because nobody else was approving it. So, so this brought telephone calls from Time magazines represented in London, wanted to know my mother's name, and I had lived a very private life, that I had run away from home and uh, debt collecting for my father at age of 16. The Newsweek got it. They paid money for it to make inquiries. So after that, when we got the book published with great difficulties, three years, you see, I have excellent letters from Collins and others that we I think this book should be published, but it doesn't fit in our our catalog, our list. It's so completely original and unique that it I didn't thought I wanted to make a book like yeah, this. Right. Now it has taken forty years that the Indian Academy now, last year they say, it has mysticism in it. Indeed it had. Mm -hmm. That was my suggestion mm -hmm. at that time. It will not be a complete man if I do not give him that. If I don't give him a God, because we all have some sort of a yearning for a superior thing. It doesn't matter what you call it. So they were there, but they weren't noticed. And afterwards, the writer London said that this is the most reviewed book in England of the 40s. It is true. Hmm. And as for reviews, space, except for one particular book by a fellow got an order of merit now. You see, I remember his name hmm. shortly. And he, uh, except his book, uh, this was the most reviewed book, and that, of course, you see, brought me. I went to Stuttgart and the German papers about visitors to Stuttgart. And it's been through six editions now. Six revisions, six editions revisions. many. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, I keep on insisting on mm -hmm. revising it till we publish the last uh, definitive edition in America to free myself from this entanglement. But I still have dreams to make a correction uh -huh. here and there. And now we have stopped it, and I'm uh, involved with rest of my work, collected works, and uh, we have a book of short stories planned now, collected short stories, there are about 30 of them. Right. And, so. and your second major literary publication is Holly, which uh, is a completely unclassifiable sort of text that's totally different in size and content and style in focus than your first uh, novel. It tells you about the experiences we grow with books, even you're a professor, you teach classes, you grow with classes. If you if we review that, every activity somehow or other shows up. And I had changed in the course of it. The war, I had seen quite horrible thing. I, throughout the bombing of the war, I continued writing the book. And uh, 
they were awful incidents. You had to be very close to it. The word war doesn't sum up things that you see. I mean, I used to live near a hospital, a bomb fell and the hot water system broke down. And you should see the patients who are absolutely incapable to be boiled alive on earth where we have so many amenities. Mm. All that had an effect on me. Right. And I couldn't be very frivolous afterwards. Well, your, your novel all about H. Hatter is more of a comic epic novel, and Holly is more poetic, it's more spiritual. You also indicated in a later text about these two books that you wanted Hatter to be every man. It would be a focus on the ordinary, everyday, average human being, and Hali would be more of a spiritual. I thought character. so. Character. And so how do you see the difference between the ordinary, everyday person and a, a more high spiritual form of being? Well, suppose I shield myself uh, by a quotation from Yoga Sutra. This is one of the courses I taught mm -hmm. here uh, in Texas, and I've been here nearly 20 years in the country. Uh, this uh, great book, it is a very great book by a very great man. Alas, people haven't discovered him fully, the Yoga Sutra by Patanjali, and he describes that we as human beings uh, are covered, as it were, with sheets, uh, an illustration of an onion, skins, mm. uh, and skins. So they, he describes five sheets. They are in the Vedas, indeed, in older books, mm -hmm. but this he systematized it. Right. So we have the physical self that we can verify with our senses. Then we have the vital self, mm -hmm. the one that gives us activities, intention. Then we have a mental self. Uh, I don't want to be too technical. And under that mental self, all activities which arise out of the mind will come in. Then there is a Vijnanamaya, the, the body or a sheet mm -hmm. of knowledge, of intuition. Mm -hmm. The word buddhi is used by, for Gautama Buddha as a superior reason, mm -hmm. but it is superior intuition mm -hmm. rather than a systematic logical consideration of a proposition. Right. Now, that makes a poet or Leonardo da Vinci have the vision of the Madonna mentally to begin with before he has put it on paper or have a problem of communication, etc. All that. It comes from that particular body. It's higher in the manner of speaking mm -hmm. in order to. So it, the every man is involved in these bodies, right. physical needs, mental needs, intellectual needs, etc., on a lower level. And beyond that, he has an Anandamaya Kosha, which is a body that has no pain, it has no suffering of any kind. The spirit of man is the other, mm. not any of these. Right. We have summarized the human being fully. But it's not one of these. Now, my everyman has, you look at this character, Hatter, he's a con amusing character, said, this can't be myself. This fellow insists that I am, but I'm mm -hmm. afraid so. Mm -hmm. If you sit down, mm -hmm. and I had given a list under challenge of human emotions compiled by Carl Jung, that list is paraphrased in the book in a vulgar language. And I told this in Delhi the other day, and sir, from uh, New Zealand came and told me that I've taught you a book 20 years there, here, but I didn't know that, and I'm going to reread the book. So I systematically listed things mm. that a common person has right. and made fun of them. Those are not in Harley. No. In Harley's religious life would be the love of the other, mm. not any of herself. I think love of God is an excellent word. The Indian word is bhakti. It means. Uh, loving devotion, mm -hmm. a surrender of will. A lot of people talk about it, they read Bhagavad Gita, they talk about it. I had a nurse in hospital, she talked about it. But it's one of the most difficult things to do, to yield one's will. We never realize this. So I was in a, uh, delivering a lecture in Bombay, mm -hmm. and we had people from Africa. There's a new class in Africa, the ruling class. Mm -hmm. I couldn't distinguish them from Englishmen. Right. Now, I was born in Africa, but right, in, Kenya. in Kenya. You see, so uh, uh, they talked about surrender. They had read the book. Mm -hmm. They were equipped by the Indian government on the Hindu tradition. And on that very day, there was in a newspaper a 
tiger cub, a white tiger cub, a very beautiful creature. And I told these people, they together employ about 50,000 men in India and in Africa, uh, that I am, after this lecture, going 40 miles out to see this tiger in the zoo, the cub. If you gentlemen come with me, not one could spare the time. Mm. They had surrendered their will and Krishna had spoken through me uh -huh. that you come and see this tiger because mm. the Lord said, I live in the tiger cub mm -hmm. too. Mm. But uh, we were not, uh, not in understanding even the theory of the thing, what is self-surrender. Mm. Uh, incidentally, that brought me to Texas too. Mm -hmm. For this particular discipline, I insist on discipline, every religion does, if it is mm. to be real. Right. And uh, uh, now and then I just yield my will, I used to, in India, five months, absolutely not react to a thing, whatever happened, to accept it as a personal discipline. Mm -hmm. It was then I received an invitation to go to Burma. I didn't know how the invitation materialized, it took many years. I haven't yet thanked the Prime Minister, <laughs> knew who came and uh, caused this. It took him three years after his pilgrimage to India. I found myself in Burma, sleeping four hours, insisted upon you couldn't sleep a little longer. They came and woke you up because it's against the rules. The Gautama Buddha directed we sleep four hours. Mm. We have one meal a day and we had meditation, unmoving meditation, for ten hours a day and ten hours walking. Now, because we surrendered our will, as far as I'm concerned, but you do not know, in actual practice, this means that you have a leech sucking your blood. I don't like these creatures. Mm. My business is to just watch the thing get bloated with blood. Mm. And if I feel a feeling of revulsion, mm -hmm. watch that event too. But be entirely impersonal, accepting both the situation. It sometimes took 20 minutes, half an hour. Mm. Uh, I didn't have time to notice that before the creature fell off and the whole bed will be full of blood. Mm. These things used to happen. It was at that time that I received an invitation also to come to Texas. I take it as an order of the fates or whatever, mm. duty mm. during that period. I turned up here and there was disturbance in 69, 70 in this country. The students were rebellious mm. and they were using classes, I suspected, as a form of protest too. Mm -hmm. But I got on very well with them and I found them very enthusiastic. But the only uh, flaw which I pointed out to them was that we were gathering information. Mm -hmm. If we had to live a religion or to study a religion, I had two subjects, Theravada Buddhism and Yoga Sutra, then we must verify the truth of these traditions. Mm -hmm. As the Buddha himself told us, come and see, reject this procedure if it does not work. Professor Dizani, let us go back a bit through the evolution of your spiritual development. You had two literary sensations in Europe, in, 19, in England in 1948 and then 1953, I think, Holly was published, but yet you decided in 1952 to return to India where for at least 14 years you were in seclusion, you were involved in meditation, and I would be interested to know what led you to leave England and this literary career that was obviously sensational, where you were one of the most respected writers and lecturers in England, where uh, T.S. Eliot and E.M. Forster and the elite were your friends. What, le what led you to give this up? This would be the goal of life for most you, people. I think so, because uh. the Indian government gave a party for me when I was leaving, and Mr. Nehru gave a lunch for me when I arrived in India. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a feeling that these things are not worth pursuing, just a feeling. Mm. I didn't have any verification or anything of the sort about it, but enough for me to say, well, we we'll change the scene and go to India. And Mr. Mm. Nehru told me to take charge of Indian Literary Academy because people told him, Radhakrishnan and I knew each other mm -hmm. and uh, in England, and he said, you can bring in these eminent people mm -hmm. to be members of Indian Academy. Mr. Nehru was the president of right. the Indian Academy. And he told me, you come 
and take charge of this thing. He sent me to his educational minister, Maulana Azad. I talked to him. I saw the chief secretary of educational ministry. It was all arranged and there were bungalows, etc., with the high officials of the government. There was a lot of poverty, etc., abroad, but it didn't affect the administration. Mm -hmm. So it was very comfortable and Mr. Nehru thought perhaps uh, I'd be an attraction. I had ambassadors. The Americans invited me too. I was on their list. At that time, you know, it was important. I mean, a yeah, prohibition in India, you could drink as much as you mm -hmm. like legally. Mm -hmm. So, I told Mr. Nehru, I'll be back within a month. Uh, I have not written about it, I've not confided in anyone. Mm -hmm. But I went to Sarnath, that is where the Buddha had uh, delivered his first sermon. Mm -hmm. And the sermon is called the Fire Sermon. Everything is on fire. We are on fire at this moment. Mm -hmm. The body has most terrible, unbearable sensations. We do not know them. The perception is at fault. These were the substance of his uh, sermon there. Now, I went to Sarnath because that was the very clean place at that time. I had just seen it for a day or two. for a day or two, and there were beautiful temples. The Chinese had come, the Japanese had come, each Buddhist country had built temples there. And it was a beautiful place, and I went there, and I thought, after two months, I received a letter from the... Stop. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it all right? We proceed on these? Uh, no, when we do, but I mean, is our approach correct? It's fine. It's good. This is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. Good. So you're speaking of 1952, you're in yeah. the uh, temples? Uh, yeah, in Sarnath. Sarnath. Now, I had traveled for about eight hours uh, on a train nearly, and when I got there I had never seen such a disagreeable place. We had no electricity in a room given to me. This room was occupied by an English nun, Buddhist nun, mm -hmm. who later on married and they gave me that room. But I found there had been monks living there and they had no light and they used uh, candles and the candle wax on the floor. Uh, it was a place I couldn't stay. So what I did was I thought I'll clean it up, got razor blades to scrape the mm. thing. And it was about four o'clock, worn out after that journey and these hours of work to clean up this place. And I fell asleep. Uh, exhaustion, it was very hot. And then I heard a gong. Uh, this, this gong is an enormous gong. You, pull a rod towards yourself about six foot and let it travel and strike this enormous dome of metal. I, I woke up, you see, with a start and I can't tell you truthfully that I have any kind of impression at all. It was as if I remembered something very important. That's it, up to date. I've tried to recall it. I've received pathetic letters from English lead readers that they've been to Sarna waited for the gong and mm. it doesn't happen to them. But uh, something very important, I can't capture it, I couldn't capture it at that time, mm. but believe me, I, I didn't go to Mr. Nehru, didn't have his job. Mm -hmm. I wrote a letter to his education minister, please, I, uh, personal reasons, I'm not able to come. Did you describe it as enlightenment, the experience? I couldn't. Or no. transformation? I, I, I or couldn't. Yeah. It is a I couldn't. It mm -hmm. is a, uh, a memory, I couldn't call it, because I have no image of any mm -hmm. description, even howsoever diffused. Right. But the fact was that uh, the editor of the Statesman Englishman, who was with the BBC afterwards, retired, and he sent a reporter to me, and he said, uh, what have you been doing from the flesh parts of Delhi? Because mm -hmm. they were celebrating in Delhi too. That brought several other things there. I just thought I would not stay here and I went to Banaras and I, through several people I met a particular teacher who lived as good teachers do, 
as Mahabharata says that a teacher will be destroyed, teacher of his spiritual precision, if he gathers a crowd. Mm. Buddha said a religion is good if it caters for solitude for a practitioner. So he lived in a very uh, secret life that I was forbidden, part of a discipline, to name him. I have not done so up till now. Some mm. years ago, I confessed that as a lapse. Mm. The government of India have a publication on Kamakya. I acknowledge my debt to him, mm. but I didn't use his name. I said, twice I have broken the discipline. That was to have mentioned his name once, and next to have fear, because I was following his will for those years. Mm. I never followed my own will. And in many cases we deferred, uh -huh. you see. So I confess that to him. And after that he initiated me to what in India is truly the occult craft, mm. not spoken of. Mm. And he, I have mentioned this in the Philosophical uh, Conference 11th at Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me that uh, you should see the deity in six months time mm. with your physical eyes mm. and if not uh, I will claim your life you die mm. and uh, by that time these preoccupations have become so serious mm -hmm. I was my agent had written a letter to the High Commissioner if I were alive literary agent mm. uh, I not nobody was bothering about me nor was I dealing with anyone I was locked inside two years in Khandala, Lonavala, you can't imagine, I mean, one needs medicine and illness, not a single label will stay on a bottle because of the downpour of the rain, mm. 20 inches a day. Mm. Uh, and at places, Charipunji and English soldiers have shot themselves, they just couldn't stand this mm -hmm. rainfall. Mm. These things happened to me, I did that because at that time nobody came to those parts of India to live, mm. it was very harsh. Well, in six months, I did not have a vision of uh, this image that I held. Mm. And I went to him and I told him, I have failed. Mm. There are ceremonies before you die. I found out a place, I wrote a letter to Street and Company London, my solicitor that please you hand over my papers to people. I had a secretary who had worked with me on the book, wrote her a letter. And we were all ready to go and uh, next day and there was this ceremony to do. Now, this ceremony involves that I become a sannyasi, a person who has renounced the world. Uh, this is a very serious business. A mm -hmm. uh, lot of thousands of people, literally in India, wear the robes of a sannyasi, and that's actually the only way you can get rid of family responsibility, your mm -hmm. woman, wife, you see. So we had to go to, through this particular procedure. That included my doing my funeral rites, renounce everything, and we had an appointment on the next day. On the way uh, to my hotel, there was a small hotel for pilgrims, and they redone it, Queen Elizabeth was coming. And I saw a notice which said, Bhrigu Samhita, Bhrigu is a great sage, and he has written a Samhita, a book, an epic, that deals with foreknowledge. He had the gift from God for foreknowledge, there are a number of sages who have it by reputation. And the British Museum had one of the original copies in London of Virgu Samhita. This Samhita, this particular document, came from, I understood later on, from the library of Maharaj of Jaipur, stolen page by page over years to make a business out of it. And it said 10 rupees, which is one dollar something, but equivalent of 10 dollars, for a question. And I had time, I thought I better see this, not intentionally, because we tomorrow finishing with everything. I uh, planned it that nobody could be bothered by finding marks on my body or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went in there, he book, opened the book at random and he told me, the sage tells me, he said, this scholar has a fourfold problem. Uh, he has, uh, uh, you have my word, and of course the deity is the one that witnesses all acts. I have never mentioned to anybody why I was in Banaras. Mm. It's just not done. Mm. And uh, first he has, his fame has left him. He has money problem. Actually I only had enough money to go back by train, that's all. You see, to wind up the last affair, mm. to get out of Banaras, that's it. 
And third, he said he has no attainment in yoga, that was implied with my practice. Right. And the fourth, imminent death, that statement, mm. in a day. Now, the next verse said that if he invokes the Lord in this form on the bank of Javali, that's a code word, mm -hmm. indeed code words are used all the time in these occult traditions, mm -hmm. they won't tell you 12,000 times this must be done, they will tell you moon eyes. Mm. You have to go to an expert, moon is one, eyes are two, that's twelve. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's all written in that way, it's fraud, the way mm. Hinduism or Buddhism has been offered mm. to Americans. I noticed that in 1670 when right. I was here. Right. Now, so he said, if he on the bank of the river, that is where I was, Javali River in Banaras, if he invokes the Lord, did, he will not have any money problem, the fame will come back, he will have Yogsiddhi, he lives. I told him, tell me how. Mm -hmm. He told me that would be 150 rupees uh, extra for that, that was only for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, I told him, please give me some time, I only have a return ticket, that's what I don't, mm -hmm. money over 10 rupees, mm -hmm. but uh, it will be sent to you, but he didn't give credit to people. And, and <laughs> in the hotel I thought, this is a good practice, we invoke the Lord anyway. I did. Next day the Guru told me, you live. That's all. Mm -hmm. And that about explains why I am here talking to you. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be, because uh -huh. the, these are serious businesses, I right. am a serious person. Right. And so, uh, after that one thing led to another, then I was sort of tired of mm -hmm. things. And uh, things were easy at that time. Mr. Nehru offered me things. Uh, I mean, in a party for drinks at the American Embassy. I had one of the great uh, agencies here. I think United Press or something offered me a job of $30,000 a year just because Delhi is a center of news without any sense. Mm -hmm. We give you the assistance. Mm -hmm. Things became easy. Then afterwards I have never let go. Here too, I mean that's mm -hmm. my main preoccupation, continues. And what is more that I had got deeper into these books of prophecy, it raised very serious questions mm -hmm. about free will. If, am I free at all? If I am not free, am I responsible if it is all God's doing? Why does he insist on the doctrine of karma, Yoga Sutra and the Gautama Buddha? I am not interested, nor was I interested at that time, 70, to prove anything to anybody. I do not like people who want to have things proved to them while they do not invest a year of their life or a penny of their money, they sit on an armchair, prove it. If you don't prove it, what do you do? He tells me by implication, I don't trust you. Mm. Now, we raised this point in that conference in Boston and I told them very deliberately, mm -hmm. I am one year short of 80 now. It does not matter. It doesn't damn well matter. Mm. What makes you think so? that your disapproval, I don't trust you, has anything at all. So, twenty years I collected these documents. Mm -hmm. The only way you could verify these documents is to keep a diary of events and watch it. Mm -hmm. Twenty-two years have passed, twenty-eight years have passed. Mm -hmm. I even got the original documents, so difficult to give because the man who possessed them was ordered by the spirit, the writer, mm -hmm. the sage, give it to him. I brought these to this country, and except two stipulation that this should be kept in this country, I belong to this country, not sent out, number of people want them. Everybody wants these original documents. The, I gave them here mm -hmm. and after my death to release it, I can't afford to have so much attention mm -hmm. directed towards me. Mm -hmm. This book proves, and I had a gentleman from UCLA, he has Nobel Prize in these techniques, he says in about 15-20 years time, Mm -hmm. Most will be able to date things which were written, say, three centuries ago. Mm -hmm. able to date millions right. years. Right. Very well. This book gives my name, place of birth, time of birth, parents' name before my birth, mm -hmm. if this document here in America is 79 years old. This week I'll be 79 years, complete 79, so mm -hmm. I start 80. Mm -hmm. How could anybody do it? In one of my columns in India, journalist columns, I gave a challenge to these astrologers that you give me a name of a child that is about to be born within a year, we will deposit your name and make you famous all over the world. Mm -hmm. None took this challenge. Mm. And about yoga, we told them, if you have any scheme for physical culture, it has nothing to do with physical culture. Mm. 
then give it to us and we will do the same thing. The Indian Defense Ministry wants this, mm. among others, to make their men mm -hmm. more powerful. I have these documents here. I have this book in view, but I'm busy, mm -hmm. terribly busy. Would you believe it now? I'm not an untruthful person. It's nonsense. It is three quarter million words I have, translation, mm -hmm. with the help of a Tamilian. These are books in Tamil, translated from Sanskrit, mm -hmm. these books tell me. How do you think, I mean, I could deal with this? Mm. this these books have already, incidents have already happened. I do not have to so create them. books of prophecy. Oh, no. no. They have philosophy in it. Philosophy, everything. prophecy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nature of God, nature of man, mm -hmm. everything in it. And where did they originate, these books? Uh, you see, if you follow mm -hmm. their texts, they are an act of service, love. Mm -hmm. And if a guru, a teacher, a spiritual teacher, told these disciples that you write these things, mm -hmm. they will do so, and they are so self-effacing, we don't even know their names. Right. Now, they, these books were written originally in Sanskrit. I have no reason right. to say that. Right. But the book tells me they were originally mm -hmm. written in Sanskrit, mm -hmm. that a Tamilian Raja, a king, right. had them translated three yeah. centuries ago. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how old their original he would tell you yeah. that this knowledge comes mm -hmm. from God, mm -hmm. and therefore human history is irrelevant. Is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But with regard mm -hmm. to to truth of these things, mm -hmm. I have a report mm -hmm. as sensational as anything could mm -hmm. except. Mm -hmm. For instance, last week I have an attorney here. I was talking to him mm -hmm. that I want to write a will. I had no time to write a will. Mm -hmm. He made a draft seven years ago. We forgot. Right. Now I talked to him. The, Texan law with regard to next of kin, mm -hmm. he tells me it is you cannot give your limbs to people mm -hmm. unless it, they get a permission from next of kin. I don't recognize these things. Right. This topic discussion mm -hmm. was in these books that I, I will see. be talking this week. Wow, not that they have a That's incredible. twenty years diary experience. Uh -huh. Right, need time. Well, let's go back to the origins of your studies, your intense studies of Indian. Uh, religions and cultures. You began in the 1950s when you were back in India to more, intense, to more intensely study the meditation techniques, the philosophies of yoga, of Buddhism. Do you want to talk about some of your early experiences after you were reborn, so to speak, or you were given your <laughs> life back? What, what were your spiritual studies and well, adventures we, after that? The thing is that mm -hmm. we not live a normal life. No mm -hmm. sadhaka practitioner lives mm -hmm. a normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, cannot. Uh, mine has an additional qualification of having died, right. ritually died. Right. So the experiences which come are good in so far as they help you uh, without a passive, no intention, no active intention. Mm -hmm. The great sage Kapila, who wrote uh, uh, a book very much like Yoga Sutra, Kapil Sutra, we have only 20 verses. Right. He had to teach somebody and he did not have a will to teach somebody. Mm. He had to create a will, create an affection for a disciple in order to have the impetus to do so. What happens is that I was in Burma and my instructions are, mm -hmm. uh, not in these words, but to verify the truth of what Buddha said. Mm -hmm. The Buddha's greatest statement is, nothing abides, nothing is permanent. If so, nothing might be worth pursuing. It's not there, including ourselves, mm -hmm. what we call ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to verify this fact, we need techniques. One of the complaints I had about the students in this country when I arrived, and they were good students, mm -hmm. and we have large classes, 250 mm -hmm. students at a time, mm -hmm. philosophy. Yeah. They wanted information mm -hmm. to be able to talk about it. They didn't want these pains which go with it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a pain. I'm in Burma. Mm -hmm. It's exceedingly hot, over 100 degrees, and we have bad water, and there are snakes all over. Nobody has killed the snakes mm -hmm. for 22 years in that monastery. Therefore, they'll just walk through your like cobras. Wow. Now, we have to have one meal a day, and mm -hmm. I found so many cobras in the morning that I miss one meal early morning. Mm -hmm. So actually leave it rather than get involved. And what I'm supposed to do is to walk very, very slowly, 
very, very slowly. It almost become a grotesque kind of a walk. Mm. Why very, very slowly? So that I could watch my responses. Since my perception is defective, that much theory I hold, no more, no less, till enlightenment comes, partial mm -hmm. enlightenment comes. The Buddha's enlightenment is not spoken of. Nobody dare speak of it. He is not a disciple of Gautama Buddha if he does. Mm. He told okay. them, nor may he show any kind of psychic or other powers which belong to that mental body. It has nothing to do mm. with the deeper thing. Right. So now, I was walking backward and forward with very, very slow motion of my foot mm -hmm. so that it will take me to cross from this wall to the other wall as long as five to ten minutes. If a person knocks at the door, nobody knocks at the door, we're not supposed to talk. Never spoken for a ages there, that I was there five months. It will take me five minutes to reach the door because there will be sensations to watch when I stand up from a chair. This pressure that I feel only when I pay attention to it, it has ceased being a pressure and my perception no longer burdened with that particular fact. Mm. And then raising my arm to reach the door and the touch of the jo door, the cold and heat sensation that I feel, which I never did before in my life, this is this practice, mm -hmm. 10 hours a day for five months. And I was just watching my instruction or to watch the feet. And there was a Burmese young woman, uh, I couldn't normally ever do such a thing. She was sitting in a most uncomfortable posture, humble posture. They bent down uh, to offer me a cold drink. You are allowed to have a cold drink. That is cold water, there's no ice there, with a little molasses in it. She may do so as a servant of holy man, that is the tradition. I saw her sitting there offering me something, but as my attention was riveted to the feet. I turned, mindfully turned, watching every motion, every movement, then went to the thing. She was there for three hours in that terrible position. I didn't see her hmm. after that. Hmm. That is the intensity of the concentration needed. Right. Right. Otherwise it will not work. The mind will not be gifted. Now while doing this, I notice every kind of a sensation. This is the culmination of a practice, it just happens. You can't make a prediction. The knees, the sensation here, the cold, heat, everything was observed. Kept on observing impersonally, we are not involved. At that time a question uh, like yours, which mm -hmm. is uh, relevant, uh, which is timely, would be very wrong. It will activate my mind. Right. It will shatter the concentration. Right. Now. This mind has been called in Yoga Sutra, I try to explain to my young friends here, mm -hmm. ekagra. That means you are accepting one object. Ek is one. Mm. So it is the foot mm. and my sensations, responses right. to it. Mm. Normally we don't. We have put people under hypnosis, they are able to read half a page of London Times. Normally they just look at the page, I saw the paper that amount of grasp. Now, when I did that, reviewing this two days afterwards, we took two minutes off to think about it, mm -hmm. not allowed, no right. time. Right. So, I found that uh, this motion, departure of the foot and then coming down, it is not a walk, it is a concept. Mm. It, it, it is stupid to call it a walk. Mm. There were breaks there, there were pauses, there were motions. They were moving forward, they were coming down, they were touching. Thirty, forty, fifty observation in us. Mm -hmm. What you call walking in a, mm -hmm. uh, primarily uh, just by looking at it. Right. It was all wrong. And then one day I found, repeating the practice, I couldn't move the leg without intention. Mm -hmm. This I had not noticed all this time. This, as soon as this realization is had, and a review, it's not enlightenment, the enlightenment is sudden from that great body inside. In this particular case, I'm trying to phrase this, you mm -hmm. see. Uh, my life changed because everything must be preceded by intention, therefore mm -hmm. all the karma deed, whole of it, is intentional. That's the verification of Gautama Buddha's definition of act. When we act, 
it does not matter whether it is inevitable by these books or otherwise. But there is the intention, we are not aware of it and we live in a world of concept, words, mm -hmm. summaries, summaries which are false. Mm -hmm. Now as soon as I did that I am afraid uh, every, this will not go, has not gone. Mm has not gone. It is what I was telling my friends here, please practice with me. And it was difficult, we were a university here, I understand the tradition, I had lectured at many universities before coming, mm -hmm. here in India, Banaras asked me, etc. But we cannot offer this instruction, it is religious, in a manner of speaking. It is to the credit of Dr. Silber and Mr. Lee, both of them, he was chairman at that right. time, met, wrote me a letter, you may. Mm -hmm. And at that time the teacher, the great teacher of this tradition who passed away some months ago uh, and the Burmese government sent me to him, uh, recommended me to him and he had issued a statement not to use his name. There were all kind of adventurers who were saying that we were his disciples. Uh -huh. We, this department at Austin mm -hmm. Philosophy was the only one that had an authority from this teacher. I showed it to Dr. Uh -huh. Lee. I, told these young friends, please follow me, they were very kind to me, they still are a number of them, but one of our students on his own, they were very curious, they just want information, mm. was doing this practice downtown. Mm. He was never told to do that, he had not graduated to that as it right. were. Now you imagine a person doing a slow death dance by moving his foot right. down the Congress Avenue, of course the police took him. People reported him, right. you see. Right. And uh, I, I said, well, whatever the value to the police by way of extra education, <laughs> this is a self willed act, an extracurricular activity, we are not responsible. Right. Right. So, it changes you that way, my dear fellow. It uh -huh. isn't, you know. You know, this is interesting because it seems like there's some contradictory teachings here about willlessness. In other words, to attain a complete state of willlessness, intentionlessness. But you're saying the opposite here. There's also an emphasis on intention, that every single movement, thought, activity is in some ways governed by intention, even though we may not be aware of it. But uh, I do not wish to make a statement because mm -hmm. there are groupisms all over India and they tell you, according to my damn book, this mm -hmm. is so. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been a movement, Time magazine uh, assigned a chief story to it that we are God and the mm -hmm. fact that we do not know we are God because you do not know mm -hmm. the question you are God, etc. Right. Now, we had a function in honor of our colleague, you know, uh, um, Professor Hartson. Right. The other day we had an Indian professor who come travelled up to here and he spoke of Brahma, and one of our colleagues rightly asked if God is sharing our experiences, mm -hmm. God called Brahma, the God, mm -hmm. then why is he such a sadist? He imposes suffering on people. Or why is this God enjoying playing right. in a situation? I have used that argument uh, with better words, really mm -hmm. stronger words, mm -hmm. protesting words. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask Shankaracharya, this prof visiting professor who was taking part in this function, rightly said, except Shankara, the Hindus do not believe they are God. Mm. It is Shankara's commentary. Now you go to Shankara himself, mm. who, who was a religious teacher and he's called a world teacher, Adi Guru, and ask him, how come if the world is Maya, there are no moral values, mm. there's no right and wrong, mm -hmm.